Good evening. In commemoration of Jose Marti's death, we are honored to present a lecture by the distinguished Marti scholar Ryan Spangler, associate professor at Creighton University, where he specializes in 19th and 20th century modernismo and avant-garde poetry. He has published on the concept of spirituality in the works of Jose Marti and Ruben Darío, and is also the co-editor of the critical anthology Sinking the Americas, Jose Marti and the Shaping of National Identity. He recently completed an English language edition of Marti's Versos Libres, soon to be published. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Ryan Spangler. More than a decade ago, I began the process of translating the complete collection of Versos Libres. Now, as part of that endeavor, I traveled to Cuba in 2016, and thanks to the incredible and generous support and assistance offered by three extraordinary Marti specialists, uh, Carmen Suarez Leon, Ana Sanchez, and Lourdes Ocampo Andina, I received permission to access the National Archives for a one-week period. Now, after putting on my white gloves, first thing I did was carefully look up through all of these documents to find the ever-famous Dos Patrias. And I will admit it was a rather moving experience to hold that manuscript so beautifully and delicately written uh, in Martí's own hand. So after that somewhat surreal experience, I realized it's time to get to work. So I took a seat, manuscripts in the box beside me, with five different Spanish language editions of Versos Libres laid before me so that I could compare them to the original writing of Martí. I will admit it was a rather enlightening experience uh, as I reviewed each manuscript, some which had multiple versions of the poems, uh, some were typed, some handwritten, some illegible, some in pristine condition, and some were extremely damaged. Now, on the first day of review, as I was evaluating the second draft of the uh, fourth poem, Albo en Pedro, I noticed on the back of the manuscript there was a portion of another poem. Now, if you turn the page upside down, um, along with some rather entertaining typing by Marti to ensure that his, the typeface was working correctly and had the proper amount of ink, you read sandwiched in between a repeated comment about a visit from Nicanor Boleto Peraza, these words. ¿Quién es Dios? Or, who is God? And just a few lines below, Marti repeats the question, but with a response. ¿Quién es Dios? Es supremo. Or, ¿Quién es Dios? Es supremo. You know, who is God is supreme is the literal translation. It could be interpreted based upon the initial question as who is God? He is supreme. Now, while I recognize that it's somewhat deconstructionist and rather dangerous to base one's investigation or study on an obscure line from amongst a selection of nonsensical gibberish, found upside down on the back side of a secondary manuscript, I found Marti's statement, a, a very simple question with an equally simple answer, intended for no one but himself, to be a confirming declaration of what I've always believed to be one of the foundational or core concepts contained in the writings, and primarily his poetry of that of Jose Marti, and that is that of God's spirituality and redemption. Now, our journey into the investigation of Marti's exploration of spiritual themes begins many years before he even typed those words. In fact, some 64 years before Marti was even born, three key events occurred that would really shape the development of Marti's spiritual poetic ideology. One, the shift towards democracy in Europe at the hands of the French Revolution in 1789. Two, Immanuel Kant's publication of the Critique of the Power of Judgment in 1790, and three, the ensuing development of the concept of Das Erhabene, or the Sublime, and I apologize if I've murdered the German, um, developed by the German Romantic poets. Now, each of these ultimately played a key role in the development of poetry, first in Europe, and then eventually in the Americas. So as scientific and philosophical thought progressed and spread throughout Europe, Many of the key poetic figures of the Romantic period noticed a vast divide beginning to form between science, technology, philosophy, and modernity on one side, and then spirituality, religiosity, and art on the other. 
So this ultimately resulted in a type of spiritual crisis that would envelop the hearts of poets and help shape a new concept that binds spirituality and poetry into a type of syncretic religion. So Friedrich Schlegel confirmed or affirmed that this is something he said. He said, religion is not merely a part of culture or a limb of humanity. It is the center of all things. It is always first and foremost. It is originality per se. Now, Schlegel suggests that religion involves some aspect of devotion or worship, a means of explaining what Rudolf Otto calls the non-rational. That is, those sensations or feelings that can only be described as ineffable or sacred. So religion, therefore, begins with a recognition, recognition of an awareness of a being, a law, sacred or holy cosmic force, a noumen, as he would call it, that governs our actions and behaviors. It is the confession of one's dependence on our creature consciousness, submerged and overwhelmed by its own nothingness, in contrast to that which is supreme above all creatures. So belief in the noumen, and I apologize, we're kind of way off base, here. not off base, but we're kind of off tangent, we're going to get here. It affects both actions and beliefs, and while such knowledge does not ensure obedience to the law, it does carry with it certain responsibility, expectations, consequences. Individual understanding of this knowledge or intuition is unique to each. So as William James once noted, that by gaining such understanding of God, coming to terms with it, we're able to, quote, reach unity, the process of remedying inner incompleteness and reduce inner discord. That is, we assert our belief. Such conviction drives an individual to action, and such action most often reasserts that faith. So Schlegel believed, as did the other great romantic poets and philosophers of his age, that poets carried the great responsibility of building the necessary bridge to cross the great schism between science and religion, between technology and spirituality, and ultimately between man and God. Now, I can assume you must be asking yourself, what on earth does all of this have to do with Jose Martí? Now, in his very famous and oft-quoted prologue al poema de Niagara, Martí declared the following, This age of splendid elaboration and transformation is for the poets. <clears throat> Those who are able to discern and overcome the confusion caused by the changes of state, faith, and governments, the age of tumult and pain, in which the noise of battles silences the melodious prophecies of good fortune of times to come. End quote. That is, Marti declares that the despair of the great modern age when he lived, exacerbated by his exile in the bustling metropolis of New York City, were the necessary precursors to his visionary poetics. Marti felt that only one whose suffering opened the door to the, what he calls the melodious prophecies of the future, or the poet, could overcome modernity's desolation. Octavio Paz notes that, quote, from its earliest days, modern poetry has been a reaction against the modern era. And it is this reaction, this, quote, invention of more or less personal mythologies made up of fragments of philosophies and religions, analogy, analogy as Paz calls it, that defines Marti's religious endeavor based on sacrifice and poetry. True salvation, wrote Marti, in one of his many cuadernos de apuntes, his notebooks, only comes through sacrifice and salvation revealed through the poetic word. So my aim today is to appreciate the religious nature of Marti's analogy, his visionary poetics, aroused by his personal and poetic crises. In his exemplary study of José Marti's poetry, Cintio Vitier characterizes Marti's vision of writing as futurity, he asserts, quote, Marti offers a vision, a truly prophetic one, of a world based on the balance and reconciliation of all human strength, end quote. In other words, Vitier defines it as Marti's ability to perceive what humanity can achieve through sustained and uncompromising dedication. I'd like to take this concept one step further. Marti's revelation continually develops, becoming more encompassing and expansive, as he unites sacred and secular history with his own. One begins to see a 
progressive vision unfold in the ever-evolving writings of Marti, both stylistically as well as thematically, as his vision and creative reappropriation of sacred and secular history coalesce. With the synthesis of vision and sacred history, crisis and poetry, Marti formulates his newly developed spiritual poetic evolution. We observe Marti's transformation of crisis into visionary experience and how he permeates these visions with sacred symbols to create a new religious mythology in his three primary works of poetry published during and after his lifetime. Ismailillo in 1882, Versos Sencillos in 1891, and Versos Libres, written sometime between 1878 and his death in 1895, but not published until 1913. It would be easy to call Marti an a-religious writer, given his disenchantment with Catholicism and the church's inseparable connection to the Spanish crown at that time. But the poet's concept of spirituality steps outside of the proverbial religious box, as he fuses his spiritual, poetic, and religious ideals into one great whole. In a letter written by Marti in 1887, which opens by praising Walt Whitman's collection Leaves of Grass, <clears throat> yeah, there we go, that's correct, um, he illustrates humanity's need for poetry. He uses it to describe religion in a similar vein as that of the German Romantics, a connection with the sublime and outside the rigidity of the traditional observed religious sects of his, of his day. Marti affirms that, quote, La poesía de la libertad es el culto nuevo. It's important to know that Marti's use of el culto nuevo to describe poetry suggests both an elevated sense of culture and refinement, as well as a type of worship, rather than a crude translation might, might suggest, calling it a cult. The Cuban bard promotes the revelatory experience of writing poetry as his most exalted and refined mode of worship, free from trite expressions that paint meaningless images or poems contorted and manipulated by the structure of verse. He seeks a poetry that stills and beautifies the present. Poetry elevates the present by pacifying, beautifying it simultaneously, calming the storms of the surrounding world, lifting the brokenhearted, inspiring them to seek liberty, this, well, the liberty that poetry advocates. Second, it reveals the poet's prophetic state by deducing and illuminating the future. Only a seer can perceive and discern the future, and poetry is his written manifestation of that prophetic mantle. Finally, and perhaps one of the most important of Marti, poetry explains the ineffable purpose and the seductive goodness of the universe. Poetry permits both poet and reader to see beyond the limits of our mortal existence. As he once stated in his cuadernos, the earth is not the entire universe. <laughs> we begin to envision not only the ever-expansive magnitude of the universe, but more importantly, the mysteries of the universe with a capital U. Note the difference here between a generalized concept of solar system, stars, planets, existing in space. He suggests a divine presence, a universe full of seductive goodness that draws both poet and reader toward it. Authentic verse enables the poet to express his vision of the universe, Marti's understanding of Hegel's absolute, bringing us in contact with an unknown creative genius. Now, because Marti's impact on Cuban independence, as well as his system and philosophy of democracy and push for an autochthonous government, he's often apotheosized as a secular saint, with his writings achieving biblical status by later generations. And while it's not my intention to view Marti through such a lens, my readings do suggest a romantic tendency in Marti to illuminate poetry's sacred character. Marti's full impact on Spanish-American literature, and specifically within Modernismo, is difficult to evaluate and comprehend. Much of what his contemporaries read of his works was limited primarily to his journalism, articles, and correspondence. Aside from his versos sencillos, his poetry did not circulate widely until after his death. In fact, Marti uh, himself was apprehensive about publishing it and distributed it only amongst his friends. Now, of all Marti's writings, 
his poetry some of the most tender, intimate, and revealing. As we read his poems, we begin to understand, first, his crises and spiritual angst, and second, the visionary quest upon which he embarks to fill the spiritual void left from his political exile and alienation. We begin to discover what he calls, quote, the unopened door of his deep spirit, end quote. Now, it's my purpose to unveil the religious facet of the deep spirit he exposes in his poetry. But let's be honest. You didn't choose to participate in this lecture to listen to me drone on about all of this. So let's get into the books of poetry. Now, with the publication of Ismailijo in 1882, Marti reimagines the poetic visionary. He creates a multifaceted work by drawing from several key biblical symbols that help frame the book's historical significance. The first of these references appears in the title, Ismailillo, or Little Ishmael. The author's use of the name Ishmael rather than that of his son, Jose Francisco, becomes more meaningful as we discern its connection to the biblical allegory. Now, because multiple scholars, Pedro Enrique Soreña, Cintio Vitier, Pina García Marruz, Carlos Ripoll, Enrico Santi, Jorge Camacho, Alberto Hernández Giroles, to name a few, have all given extremely insightful readings of this collection. I'm going to try to avoid simply repeating what they discovered long before I ever even encountered Jose Martí. So instead, I hope to address Martí's intentional self-appropriation of Ishmael's life and destiny upon himself. Although Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abraham and Hagar, the Egyptian handmaid to Abraham's wife Sarah, and heir to the birthright, the great patriarch reluctantly sent Hagar and Ishmael into the desert, assured of the Lord's covenant that, quote, of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation. Now, Abraham's birthright was then given to Isaac, son of Sarah, while Ishmael was left destitute of both physical and spiritual inheritance. Marti compares his own experience of exile to the story of Ishmael, taking upon himself both the prophetic role of Abraham and the destitute exile of Ishmael. While it would seem reasonable to suggest that his own son serves as the capacity or serves in the capacity of Ishmael, a viable theory proposed by Carlos Ripoll himself, the reality of the allegorical framework implied in Marti's poetry would suggest otherwise. In the biblical narrative of Genesis, Abraham would abandon the rich plains of his father in Ur and later Haran after receiving a covenant of the Lord that he would, quote, be a father of many nations, end quote. Additionally, the Lord's assurance and covenant with Abraham regarding Ishmael's destiny resulted in Ishmael's and Hagar's departure from the land of Canaan. Abraham, Ishmael, and Marti were all exiled from the lands of their inheritance. But with that exile came the hopes and promises of the creation of a great nation. The Israelites through Abraham, Muslims through Ishmael, as was believed by most scholars during his day, and Cubans through Marti. As the progenitor of Cuban democracy and ideologies, Marti invokes the Abrahamic covenant and prophetic mantle to pronounce a new birthright upon himself, the embodiment of a new Ishmael, through whom the promised covenant of prosperity and liberty would engender a new people in his own promised land. In this sense, Marti exemplifies his role of both the father and the son, creator and redeemer, who hopes to preserve his beloved people and return them to the rightly deserved and promised land of Cuba. Enrico Santis, in Enrico Santis' foundational study of Ismailillo, he focused his attention in great part upon the concepts of exile and abandonment, in particular with respect to Marti's wife, Carmen Saida Bassan, and her correlation with Hagar, but also on the development of his Versos Graves that founds the basis of his reading of Musa Traviesa. <clears throat> Within his study, he cites a lesser-known poem, not included in the publication of Ismailillo, called Dentro del Pecho Tenía, written at the same time as Sueño Despierto and Sobre Mi Hombro. Two poems that were both included in the collection. Now, I mention this particular reference because the poem, which Santi includes in his discussion, is the seed for the association between Carmen and, and Hagar, also further confirms my suspicions. On multiple occasions in the poem, he references his son. Quote, I have wings, and I will fly. They are from my son. Or, 
But in your breast, O child, I keep my shield. Or, to whom shall I turn my eyes? To my son. And, I only desire the, arm, the arms of my son. Nevertheless, within the heart of this poem, we find this line. Quote, Shadows that populate the American Andes, defeated, by whose fervid spirit I feel like the sun. Marti's contemplation of both roles, as the patriarch Abraham, who finds solace during his exile through his boy, and as the exiled son Ishmael, who will take the ardent spirit of a defeated people and make a great nation of them is pivotal for our understanding of Marti's need to take upon him the expiatory roles he willingly embraces at the close of his life. Marti's close evaluation of the biblical account further reveals that changing, that changing his son's name also signifies a type of covenant between parent and child. Prior to the birth of Abraham's second son Isaac, Abraham, at the time known as Abram, was visited by the Lord and informed of the impending birth. This promise included a child and a covenant that nations would arise from his, from his lineage, a pledge revealed both physically through the birth of Isaac and poetically through the transformation of Abram's and Sarai's names to Abraham and Sarah. The name change becomes significant for its intended meaning. The Lord would make Abraham exceedingly fruitful and make nations of him and kings shall come out of him. Unquote. This promise, foretelling both a political and spiritual redemption through the long foretold Christ, reveals excuse me, um, reveals Marti's intentionality with the name change. By self appropriating the name of Ishmael, a name that means the Lord has heard thy affliction, Marti creates a binding covenant with his son, and in turn all Cubans that empowers them with the knowledge that he has heard their cries. His poetic work thus envisages an alternative to the Judeo-Christian tradition established with the passing of the Abrahamic covenant onto Isaac. Marti's poetic collection becomes scriptural as he embraces the identity of Ishmael, the embodiment of both his exile and his covenant to his people, to return them to their promised land. In the preface, um, to, Ish, to Ismailillo, Marti confirms that it is more than a book of poetry about a son. It outlines the essential components for overcoming what he believes are the social, moral, and religious malaise of his day, and reveal the overall spiritual birthright that Marti hopes to bestow upon his son, and ultimately Cuba. Indeed, the connection between father and son serves as the reigning symbol of Marti's drive towards both spiritual and and political autonomy. In many ways, Marti's verse, verses represent the innocent child who speaks truth with unwavering fidel fidelity. This drive for sincerity is Marti's overarching theme is for spirituality, and the child its most substantial agent. In the context of crisis, Marti's chief preoccupation is the child's awareness of his father's authenticity. At the time of writing a number of poems from the collection, Marti was physically separated from his child, who was in Cuba, while Marti remained exiled in New York City or traveling to Venezuela. The image of his son is thus perforce, non-physical, visionary. His perception of the child correlates with his faith in the possibilities for all Cubans, and through his visions of the son in the present, he discerns the imminent fate of Cuba when he will take upon himself the essential role of the son as redeemer of his people. This prophetic journey begins with Principe Enano, the Dwarf Prince, which describes both the son's playful dominion and the father's humble obeisance and willful submission. There's no denying the political implication of this poem. His son, the embodiment of Cuba, rather than Spain, rules over the poet. In fact, Spain will not play any part in determining the poet's identity throughout Ismailillo. He intentionally makes his son, and consequently Cuba, sovereign of his soul. Although dependence upon a single political figure has never been a part of Marti's politics, by placing his son 
the incarnate representation of both his poetry and the Cuban people, as the sole ruler of the poetic self, the speaker intends to denounce all forms of suppression. In effect, the speaker underscores his independence from poetic servitude, religious dogma, and colonial Spain by shifting his trust to his son. Principe, oh, sorry. Principe Enano begins with the speaker exalting the son's simple characteristics and associating them with a monarch to accentuate his nobility. Opening with a description of the dwarf prince's physical features, the poem accentuates his contrasting air of gentleness in the, quote, blonde, soft locks that hang gently upon his shoulder, and the power of his eyes, black stars that fly, shine, breathe, and flash like lightning. This child carries the noble birthright in his association with a crown that permits him to be tender, like a soft pillow, or demanding, like the spurs of a rider urging his horse forward. These contrasting metaphors continue as the powerful father succumbs to the will of his son. The son tames the father, taking the latter's time-worn hands, and guides him easily and without restraint. The child's supremacy, which requires no forceful action, culminates in the saving power of the son's blood. Of all biblical images, blood is perhaps one of the most symbolic. The ritual of a blood offering was made anciently to cleanse sins, and it became, for God's chosen people, an outward expression of repentance, and eventually an expiatory representation of the crucifixion of Christ. Even Jesus himself, while instituting the Last Supper, spoke of wine as his blood, declaring, For this is my blood of the New Testament, partaking, um, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Just as partaking of the symbolic blood of Jesus sanctifies, so too does the speaker receive a form of salvation from his son's blood, it, quote, gives life to his withered veins and empowers him with a renewed sense of being. In a way, this, uh, the son's presence acts as a sacrament that restores the speaker. Now, in 1882, at the time that Marti was publishing Ismailijo, he had simultaneously begun another collection of poems, Versos Libres, that would not be published until after his death. And while I won't go into detail about the history and the enigmatic structure behind this collection, it should be noticed that, that noted that Versos Libres serves as a mirror to Ismailijo, wherein the sun serves as the figurehead of the first collection. In this work, the word takes center stage. Both the sun and the word serve as synonymous figures in the biblical sense as well as in Marti's poetry. Marti wills poetry, or the word that is, not to be a cerebral ferment, Sincerity, integrity, and an extensive compilation of his visions define authenticity. Visions are original in the sense that they constitute an authoritative struggle. The claimed authenticity rests upon the fact that these poems, connected through both the visionary mode and the blood covenant, personify his spiritual development. He states, quote, I cut them out of me. They are written not in the ink of academia, but in my own blood. What I offer you in these poems, I alone have seen. I have seen them, and I have seen many more, which fled from me before I had the chance to capture each vision. The poetry alone asserts the legitimacy of a personal mythology, closely tied to the Christological narrative that he hopes to personify. In the famous Canto de Otoño from this collection, the poet elaborates on the necessary and inseparable relationship between father and son and the looming presence of death, that beautiful muse who has the power to both separate and unite the two. His description of death in this poem introduces the reader to the despair that ceaselessly haunts him. Distinct from those who would return home to a spouse and child, the speaker is greeted by death at the door. This presence reminds the speaker of his need to embrace her before succumbing to the world's falsity. His despair wrought upon him, quote, when great distance divides parent and son, carries a dual metaphor. While the poem mentions one son and parents in the plural, 
Marti's son, José Francisco, was only separated from one parent, his father, while living in Cuba with his mother. Marti, on the other hand, in the role of the child, finds himself separated from his earthly parents due to his state of exile. Both of Marti's parents were still alive at the time that, poem, that the poem was written, and the impact of that separation is clearly evident. Additionally, Marti clearly adopts the role of the father, as he accepts the inescapable truth that his son's, quote, cries and his love cannot entreat in his defense, end quote. The speaker's allusions to his son refer, once again, to his poetic and spiritual quest. The father requires the redemptive balm of Gilead provided solely by the child. Without him, death usurps the son's prime position, and the enlightened vision and poetry born from them are replaced by his sterile labor, sad and dark. The son's absence creates a void in the poet where he can no longer envision himself, and the poet finds himself destitute and waiting for death to take the father before he receives the, and provides redemption. The only hope is for the son's return. Similar, similar to Ismailijo, where the son's apparition brings, quote, light, laughter, and air, he finds respite in the son's memory. Death, according to Martí in his Cuaderno de Apuntos, quote, plays with the injured, pallid soul like my son, pure and rosy, plays with the first yellow leaves of fall, end quote. But rather than fear death's looming presence, the speaker's feelings towards her are one of frenetic love. He needs to focus on his son and run from her, stems not from fear but the enticement of her love. He has seen death's beauty and allowed her to linger extensively, suggesting Marti's flirtation with redemptive martyrdom and self-sacrifice. The speaker's only protection is his son, the, quote, the one whom his guilty love brought to life, end quote. And though the poet avoids her eternal embrace, which is destined to envelop him, he concedes that he is already dead without the sun beside him. Rather than succumb completely to her beauty, the poet's irresolute vacillation between death and the sun transports him to the sacred site where life and death interact, where each first succumbs to the influence and the power of the other, only to later concede that same power. By calling upon the city of Salem, the original name given to Jerusalem, and specifically El Sepulcro, or the Sepulchre, the place of Jesus' burial and resurrection, the speaker places us within a sacred space that he has modernized to be within the city. However, rather than find Jesus, or even his son, Jose Francisco, we find modern men. The speaker urges every man to promptly anoint himself a soldier of love, rather than exact a vicarious atonement in their behalf. Every individual holds the key, love that is, to their own redemption. The speaker solicits those soldiers to do away with hatred, take up their own crosses, earn the prize that awaits them, and cease to depend on another to determine their own destiny. They must choose it for themselves. As we approach the close of the poem, the speaker reminds us that death's embrace is imminent. She waits at the door every autumn afternoon, preparing his death robes. The speaker's daily autumn engagements with death are a constant reminder that the speaker is ever aware of the father's dependence upon his son for redemption to take place. The poet determines to accept his fate and receive death's embrace. His authenticity and integrity remain intact. His love for all prevails, and the only robe he has donned was born from his own suffering and sorrows. While others would adopt the corrupt priestly robes of purpura as a sign of their political or religious achievements, emblematic of their abandonment of their ideals and morals, the poet will never clothe himself in purpura. Now, a purpura, aside from meaning the color purple, also suggests both a funeral robe and a robe worn by high priests, emperors, and kings. It is a sign of worldly splendor, but of greater significance, Purpura is a poetic term referring to human blood. The poet, therefore, has only worn a robe made of his own blood. All he has to show for himself is his sacrifice. The poet's great offering is himself, his work, 
suffering and sacrifice can only be proven with that last great and final sacrifice. Distinct from the poem's first line where he, quote, tearfully, I avoid my lover's embrace, end quote, now he, he proclaims, Abre los brazos, listo estoy, madre muerte. Al juez me lleva. I'm ready, mother death. Take me to the judge. The son's intervention comes at the most opportune moment. In the very instant when the poet succumbs to death's solicitation, the son emerges to protect him. He appears exemplifying Christ-like characteristics, outstretched arms, anguished breasts, naked feet, pallid hands. The son's open invita invitation to live supersedes death's embrace. His anguished breasts, possibly emblematic of the sacred heart, projected from his chest, an image quite prevalent in the entire collection, pains for the suffering of the speaker. His naked feet and pallid hands, however, remain unwounded, not having suffered yet as redeemer. The sun appears in rescuing vision to conquer death's premature grasp. His arrival brings new hope to the speaker, who immediately casts away death. Because the sun's death and feet remain unwounded, the speaker cannot yet taste of death. He must keep living until the, quote, arduous struggle, replete with weapons, pierces the sun. The speaker's redemption through the sun reflects that salvation offered by the Nino in Ismailijo. Unbeknownst to us, however, because he is both father and son, the child's gentle gift of redemption to his father merely prepares the poet to endure the battle until his own body has become pierced taking upon him the full responsibility for the salvation of his people. At the very heart of the poem, Yo sacaré lo que en el pecho tengo, or I will pull from my breast, the speaker's self-awareness of the gravity of his redemptive role comes full circle as he adopts Christ-like characteristics and suffers the harm his son had avoided while rescuing him. Each image in the sequence emulates an expiatory responsibility suffered by Jesus. He first mentions that not a single pore of his body remains unwounded, suggesting a pain so great that the entire body would bleed, a suffering comparable to Jesus in Gethsemane, who, quote, sweat as it were great drops of blood, end quote. The speaker's evident reference to the sacrifice of Jesus transforms the sacred mythology from the Bible into his own work as he and the Son become one. <clears throat> Furthermore, noting that stilettos have pierced both the poet's feet and hands between my nail and my fingertips, we see an immediate connection to the crucifixion on Calvary. The parallel to Jesus continues, as the speaker suggests, quote, cruelly they have eaten my heart, and in this enormous game of life filled with fortune, they feast upon my blood like an owl, end quote. Although grotesque in its implications, Marti's description parallels Jesus' teaching. Consider what uh, this declaration from one of his many clashes with the Pharisees, that all people must, quote, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, end quote, if they were to obtain eternal life. The great Cuban incorporates Jesus' suffering into his new mythology to emphasize the depth of his own anguish and invite his readers to participate in his impending sacrificial atonement as father and son. Without redemptive agony, poetry and freedom would cease to exist. Yet distinct from Jesus, who invited all to come and eat, those who eat of the poet are parasites, feasting upon their prisoner. The poet's internal struggle begins to mirror, mirror poetry's conflict with language. Each verse is trapped by its body, language, and words, which are incapable of conveying the intended message. Instead, poetry must sit quietly, waiting for someone to discern the silent revelation imprisoned within each word. Poem parallels the poet as they simultaneously struggle to redeem a fallen people through the sacrificial blood they shed. With the publication of Ismaili in 1882, Marti began to bring sacred and secular history together to create a new poetic religious mythology. He strove to return poetry to its sacred analogy, what Octavio Paz deemed true religion, the fountainhead of the Holy Scriptures, end quote. 
he merged sacred and secular traditions, fusing them with his own history and writing. Like many of the religious stories and symbols he references, Marti founds his spiritual ideology in self-sacrifice. Many of his personal experiences form the basis of his crisis that inspired each of his poetic works. Unfortunately, Marti's final sacrifice came before his new mythology was fully unveiled. With his premature death in 1895, he was unable to finalize Versos Libres and reveal the crisis that unifies his progressive vision, which led to the universe. Marti's spiritual vision adapted traditional Judeo-Christian theology to the age in which he lived. His understanding and interpretation of the Holy Trinity of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit took on new forms as they applied to his own search for political and poetic redemption. He saw God the Father as, quote, the universe in all its variations and its oneness, the essence of life. Jesus the Son and Redeemer, was the Word, quote, in poem, the personification of the eternal human soul, factories, industries, peculiar triumphs, great and new currents, not monasteries, courts, or military camps, but workshops, organizations of new classes, forges, tunnels, popular processions, days of liberty, resistance against dynasties, and attacks on ignorance. The third and final member Holy Spirit, was history's essence, history's soul, everything people's lives teach us. Marti's vision learned from history's great wealth of experience, narrated accounts of redemption and sacrifice, and encompassed the essence of the universe. With all three combined, one could, quote, deduce the true significance of progress, foretell and glimpse into the future world, and see the final destiny of our spirit." End quote. Ultimately, it was this essence, this universe, this God, whom Marti truly sought throughout the course of his life. Although he never connected with a specific religion, which he actually says quite explicitly after his departure from Catholicism, he ultimately strove to find a connection between himself and God. In his Cuadernos de Apuntes, he elucidates this spiritual or religious foundation, quote, Essence is an extensive chain between man and God, whose links are thorny. A bridge obscured at first, then clear and brilliant as we draw closer to it. Man walks towards God. He is the light shining at the end of the bridge. That is why good men find joy in goodness and desire to be better. Marti's ultimate goal was to take the good around him, and make it better. He sought to liberate and redeem Cuba, the very people and place that had rejected him. He hoped to leave a record of his quest for authenticity, a path marked in the very poetry he strove to liberate. And in the end, he would walk the path that would carry him towards the self-same redemption he sought for in others. Perhaps the best way to close this would be to return one last time to his poetry. The opening stanza of his poem, Qual de incensario roto best explains the conclusion of his progressive vision. Like perfume fleeing from a broken incensory, so escapes my verse through my suffering. I am nourished by the pain that consumes me. From where I came is where I shall go, the universe. Marti's verse, born from his suffering, takes him back to the universe. Marti, the embodiment of his own poetic work and ideals, the one true Son, the Word incarnate, returns to the presence of the universe. As the great poet returns from exile, reuniting with his beloved Cuba, so too does the Word yield to the will of the universe, wherein Marti, José Francisco, Abraham, Ishmael, Cuba's forefathers, Cuba's future, Jesus and the Father, emerge as one great whole. Thank you.